opening of Prelude Number Eight in A Minor, Rachmaninoff's fabulous Prelude from the Opus Thirty Two Preludes. This is a whirlwind of a piece. It's non-stop sixteenth notes all the way through, which remind me of a wind sweeping and swirling, and over that dancing around between the two hands is punctuated by a rhythmic motive of yep pa pum and it's all over the registers of the piano, alternating with the hands, exploring the entire range of the instrument, and it's all based around the tonality of A minor. This is an acrobatic piece, and I consider it a psychological conclusion to all of the eight preludes that we've already been talking about here as a little mini finale, a little break in the end, and then from that point on, from 9 through 13, it's a whole other world. So this is really an ender of sorts. And to begin, he is bursting on the scene, kind of like probably number one did, like this. But this time it's coming down and outlining that A minor tonality for sure. This is the left hand. three pitches. The E is the dominant, the C is the median third scale degree, and the A of course is the one, the tonic. So with the ending of that two measure intro, he has these three. And this is very interesting, the counting on this is in 6-4 time, and he's constructing these two utterances of that opening statement starting on the upbeat, the sixth beat. So it sounds, if I count, like this. One, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, again, six, one, two, three, four, six, one, two, three, four, and a fermata. Now that's pretty dramatic. That's your intro. Then a little tiny rest to catch your breath. And then the piece really begins for the rest of the piece. Pianissimo, molto leggero, very light and delicate. And now the strong fortissimo has transferred into the gossamer passage work. He very beautiful writing. Now over that is this rhythmic mode of yet the thumb. And look what it's outlining. Three E's, stating the dominant, and then the second voice states the third scale degree C, and the last voice ends on the tonic, the A. How ingenious is that to take your broken triad and let us hear these pitches like that? And it's like this, right hand, all the fives, and then the left hand, long note to end. Then it repeats again, short, short, long, and then... Then we have our second motive, which is just two notes, still on the broken third. And that sounds like this in measure five. All played with the left hand. Repetition, except it's expanded now. Now that little two note motive I just played here, measure six and seven, sounded pretty short, didn't it? And it is shorter. Those two measures go to four four time. Very interesting, because he only wants this crossover idea to last that long. It has to be in four four time. Over that idea, is a very beautiful descending passage for the whirlwind 16th notes of the right hand. Slowly sounds like this. Can't you see the little swirls and the gusts of wind doing that? And the outer intervals are sixths. And I like to block these to really get the richness of the harmonies in here. These are chord clusters. And then 
when you put the cross over, I said crossing it because it's the left hand that's crossing over the right hand. Very beautiful. Then back to six four time. Six one two three four five six one two three four five six one. Now listen to the pitches on the downbeat. That one that I said strongly is a long note, and he's punctuating first the A, measure eight, measure nine is the F, and then measure 10 is the C. So he's taking us somewhere. And those sound like this with all the rhythmic motives together minus the whirlwind 16th notes. So this is what you have, the upbeat to measure eight, and this is exactly how it's played. voices with just this right hand with the fifth finger I have to do the tapping staccatos and then the other fingers I have to play the legato 16th notes this is tricky that time goes to the D now measure 10 stays in 6-4 time and has the descending sixth coming down Contracting fifth, third, pulling it in. And it's in a diminuendo when I get to pianissimo here. Being now that this is in the 6 4 measure, he's getting a longer length of the descent of that tumbling motive of the right hand and the crossing over. Same idea as the measure we had before, uh, measure six. Those are identical, and then it continues to slips down to the lowest E octave on the keyboard. That's our dominant E. What do you think is going on with that? Well, let's put the hands together first here, measures 10 and 11, to see how he gets to that low E. Okay, and these are, one thing I want to say, very important here, Rachmaninoff has accents on these first two in the note C-A, which I consider those two pitches from the beginning of the intro as a type of light motif that he's using all the way through the piece to say A minor, three, one. So he starts right here accenting the C-A, and these are more quiet. These are louder. These are choir. And see, it's a dialogue. It's two voices even there with just the left hand. Now, starting here with measure 10, let's see how he gets to that dominant E. <laughs> this is so great here. Listen to this now. I love this. Sneaks up that tenor. is that this see how that's D sharp coming up here forces the E he's repeating that E idea with a little counterpoint here with this tenor melodic fragment that he's using it's the first legato sweep that we've had just it's got some vibrato to it maybe a cello would play that and over it, listen to what happens to the whirlwind idea of 16th notes. I'm going to play slowly here because these intervals become very interesting. So far that sounds familiar. Now watch. Well, it's a diminished chord, isn't it? And then it sweeps. Oh, do, 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 do. There. These are the last two measures for our first page of our chart. Sounds like this. So he hasn't gone anywhere. We're still A minor. Fabulous piece, isn't it? Just 
I find this a remarkable piece. All of them are. And I want to show you what I'm looking at now. This beautiful, I think it's beautiful, new engraving that I made. I made this up. I made the concept up about 15 years ago. And fortunately now, because we are in the digital age, and this is public domain music, I got the opportunity to re-engrave all of these preludes. And my edition, which you can get from my website, sallychristianmusic.com, as digital downloads, comes on the new format of the horizontal landscape, 11 inches by 17 inches wide. All right away, you can see music doesn't look this way. Music is never this wide. And what this allows me to do is to get these vast stretches of material all on one line. System one, system two, system three. Now my music here is all marked up for the lesson. Your music comes like this, black and white. Looks quite a bit different, doesn't it? I just love how restful these are on the eye. And look at all of the space in between the systems, which is fantastic. Another feature, most music doesn't give you the option of all of this extra width here to make your notes. Extra fingerings, all your discoveries. This is a real plus. But the most important thing is it's laid out in the sentences and the phrases of how the piece is really constructed. So you get your head around this piece right away. Each of these are units, standalone units. Well, let's go back to my music and talk a little bit about what we just had on this first page. Here is our introductory burst onto the scene, fortissimo two measures, and look at this giant fermata right here. Then comes the leggero pianissimo, and here's measure four, five, the six and seven, which went to the two, the four, four. Now right here, see how that lines up? That's beautiful. There's the repetition of opening idea with expanded motives. Look at all of these red brackets everywhere. You get these red brackets. You get them in the color satellite view. And I'm gonna show you that right now because for me, this is the most exciting part of the entire chart package. I spend weeks on these, months really. I agonize over these. But in the end, I get so much out of it because I think I'm really getting into the mind of Rachmaninoff of what's really here. Here is your entire piece on the vertical axis of 11 by 17 inches lengthwise. It's on two pages. And when you get yours printed out, print them on cardstock, just put some heavy tape at the back and they'll fold nicely, be the same size as your working uh, main file on the three page chart that you're learning your notes from. So what we have here is a key code. The ostinato EEEs, I put blue circles around. The following third motive is what's in the red bracket. And you can see how many times with your opening section here, up beat to measure four, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and twelve. Twelve repetitions. Thirteen if you count the one into the page two. Of that falling third motive. And where are the two note descending thirds that crossed over? Well, they're right here. Look how beautifully that lines up. Here's your four four measure. I put these in the dashed boxes. And here's the six four measure. Like material. So you can see the first time it's in 4-4 four, four time, repetition. The second time it's expanded into the 6-4 time to accommodate the more length, the longer notes. And that gives Rachmaninoff the chance to announce the dominant here. And this tenor fragment, melodic fragment. Now we begin here, right here. We're going to come back to this and see what happens on page two of our working copy. This is just terribly exciting. I'm going to take the left hand alone here. This is measure 14. And what do we have? This is still in 6-4 time. Then he's climbing up. He's climbing. 
coming up. E minor. Now we go to 4-4 four, four time. And we're going to stay in 4-4 four, four time for quite a few measures. One, two, three, four, one. Inversion of G major. Two, three, four, one. Beautiful moment. This is an inversion of B flat major. Now over that, the right hand with our continuous 16th notes. Well, this is a fabulous thing that Rachmaninoff did. I haven't seen him do this in any of the other preludes. What he's doing is tying the middle note of the triad. Instead of playing the full three notes and going up like this, he could have. Still sounds pretty cool. But by tying from the previous measure, the middle note of that triad, this is how he hold my four and play the fifth. And the next one. So really, that's what your hand's doing with fingers two, five, but you're holding with the fourth. Tonality from the G major to the B flat. Beautiful. Did you know that the B flat is the lowered second scale degree in A minor? But by putting a major chord on that, B flat major then becomes the Neapolitan chord. And he likes to do that too. We saw him do that in the previous prelude. So now let's put the hands together. And listen to this. I call this the uh, rapid modulatory four measure ascent. And it's ascending by rising thirds all the way up building, 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 building to the B flat major. This is a triumphant moment. And I hear horns at that moment. But he starts off not with the horns. What would he start off with? This is piano now. Each one a little bit bigger. Now, coming down with our motive, of course. Bum, ba, ba, bum, ba, ba, bum, ba, ba, bum. Where's he gonna go? Listen to this left hand. Fabulous. Down to the D, the subdominant. Would you imagine that from here in two measures space? It's going to go to here. That's the clash here. The right hand has this. So how did he get there from here? He got there like this. Out of the blue, he moves it up to here. That's A minor. And he is taking that fragment as an ostinato and playing it eight times. And above it, he's doing a punctuation of the G soprano and two Fs, three Fs, and an E, and a D, and a C. That's an instrument. That's a separate instrument. And below it is this constant. And that sounds like this. Oh, this is marvelous writing. Measure 19 is the first of this right here. Flashing seconds. A minor. And one last ostinato coming down. And that's the end of the 4-4 four, four meter. The left hand now, this is the best part, coming right here with the B flat major. Here, listen, this is the peak of your mountain. This tenor that we had on page one against that bass, he's developing further here like this. I call this the passionate outcry of the tenor. The bass is holding on this D. Tenor jumps up to the E. It's a ninth above. But it's plus an octave. It's way up here. And he 
repeats the whole idea down a step. Tenor. Beautiful. It's a moment of real lyricism. And then, right back, he sneaks in. This is uh, all the white keys again here. And listen to this. These are beautiful tints. Yeah, da, 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 da. I hear pizzicati here. Can't you see these? Yip, bop, 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 and the basses. Lo and behold, C and an A. That's that light motif again of those two pitches. So let's put the hands together so you can hear this marvelous sweep. And let me show you my music here. I just adore this part of the piece. This always happens to me when I'm working on these prelates to this degree. There comes one moment that I lock into a motive or an emotion or a voice and it happened right here with this tenor. When I heard this tenor and I gave it the title Passionate Outcry because that's what it is for me. Where did that come from? What was going on inside of him to make that come out? So this is my B flat major, peak of the mountain here, and then this long, 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 long line, and the resolution to the C and the A cadence, back to A minor right here. So let's play that now and see what that all sounded like. It's so mm, just beautiful. Okay, here we go. because where we are right now is the end of your first page on the satellite view. Let's open this up. So here was your ascent. Now I put in the green box here the four measure ascent here with the rapid modulatory four measure ascent with the rising thirds and the B flat major, Neapolitan chord, top of the mountain, coming down, coming down, coming down, and this beautiful subdominant impassioned tenor cry, down a step to the C, another tenor cry, and the ostinato back to A minor, and ending, concluding with the parallel pizzicati tenths arriving right here. So psychologically, there's your first half of the piece. And I recommend that you take your satellite view, color satellite view, you also get a black and white, but I love the color here. And take it outside somewhere. Take it with you in your car and park somewhere by a beautiful, quiet spot where you can be in your own thoughts uninterrupted. Turn off your cell phone and study this. Try to play it in your mind just by looking at this. It's very powerful. So here now we have come to the midway point of the piece. And what do you see? This is where the piece becomes, oh, well, it's just amazingly complex. It's unpredictable, it's erratic, it's volatile, it's ever-changing. There are so many things going on here. I had to divide these five measures, one, two, three, four, five, into two components. One of them is in the dashed boxes here, built on the same principle that he established right here with these descending two note thirds. But this time, they are leapfrogging over each other and they're taken by the two hands. There's the right hand, left, 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 right, this one, right, now these pink circles are what I'm calling out. Right, left, 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 right. In between, what do you see? More of the motive of the broken third. Yeah, da, 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 da. But he 
he's changing it. There's a change up here. The last interval here, these are all broken thirds, third, and end with the fourth. Ends with the third, ends with the third, ends with the diminished fifth. Now I can't wait to play this for you so you can hear what these sound like. This is where the piece gets really, really gnarly. And it's going to uh, be very beneficial for you to break this down. I'm just going to show you what my music looks like here. So you uh, aren't too shocked when you see this. This is truly a minefield. Now I don't expect your music to ever look like this. Part of this is in preparation for the lesson. But there is a, there's a four part harmony all the way through here with these five measures. Really uh, probably 20 different details. I'm going to try to break this down into a way that will help you in learning it. So let's first take what we have with our bouncing leapfrog broken thirds. This is the uh, measure 26, where we preceded by. Here's your A, and the left hand comes up with the C A that we know as our leitmotif. So far, that's just like our page one when we heard it. And then it closes here, right hand fourth on C. Moving to measure 28, he does the same notes with the right hand, this time on the C, left on the A. You see how I had to switch the hands? That's what you have to do. Now those were identical pitches. Everything else is different. Let's take a look at the right hand notes below. Now we get this in measure 26. This is the whirlwind. The upper notes are coming down F, E, D sharp, D natural, C sharp, C natural. What did that make? Chromatic descending scale. But he doesn't do them with clusters. He does them with the little zigzagging. Helps to block that. Then, skipping a measure and going to measure 28, the next idea goes back to the little descending clusters. And this is what these sound like. Those are the same sixths that we had on the page one. And then the final measure, 30, has more of the chromatic descent for the upper. Isn't that interesting? First one goes chromatic, and then, and then. and 30. Those measures have that idea. You see that here? This is really going to help you. I just took this measure 26. I circled on my descending chromatic top notes in pink. They have dashes on them because he wants you to bring those out a little bit louder. Then here's the, we'll get to that in the next part, but continuing here, pink circles on the sixth descending, and then another chromatic descent with the pink circles here. So like material here, here, and here. Let's put those measures together. I told you I was gonna take this apart and be rather detailed on this. And so this, with just those measures slowly, sounds like this. Ending with this. The next one, that is, here, he went to here, and then, took us to E minor. 
from E major. That's what I mean, the ever-changing. This is just happening very, very fast at lightning speed. See, this is really hard to read out of context like this. Now let's take a look at these other two measures, measures 27 and 29. We have in the soprano, the upward stems are doing arietta da, 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 all with the fifth finger, like this. E, E, C, 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 A, 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 E. That's the fourth finger. Then the companion measure, C, C, A, 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 F, 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 B natural. That's interesting, isn't it? See, he's playing around with that motive. So it's almost like a development section harmonically. Underneath that now comes a wild alto line with the beat notes sounding like this, all with the second finger. I couldn't believe this when I found it. And then the companion measure. Oh, that was, that was just a tremendous moment of unsettled appearance. Do you see that that's on either side of the A? He does that all the time. He's, he's giving little clues, dancing around the tonic. Now that's not it for the alto. It's really the constant 16th note. So this is the full alto part. And then... when we put the soprano and the alto together. We have to articulate the da 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 and da 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 all with one hand. And then it's very, very difficult. Okay, so now what do you think he does in the bass in the left hand? This, again, two-part harmony. I'm going to play first the part as written, and what we have for the left hand. And then the companion measure. Each one ended with a fifth, and that made the pattern. you can do that. The upper notes, if I just take that with the tenor, makes this line. And the next one. Listen to that. I'm going to bring that out louder. It's beautiful, isn't it? It's a melody. become very expressive. Now let's see if we can put, I just want to do a little experiment here with the blocking. Forget the 16th notes. Let's just block the 8th notes with the hands together and see what we have. Very pretty, isn't it? Here we go. Next one. Sorry. together right here measure 27 hmm. you know I'm going to do the preceding measure starting at 26 and I'm just going to play the whole five measures through so you can hear it as the sweep that it is okay <laughs> Page three. 
page three, and I'm going to hold up my two pages together because it shows another benefit of the loose leaf format of these charts. And what we just finished was here at the bottom of page two. The top of page three, if you lay it down like that, by the way, all of these dark red letters here is the upper line of the tenor. And that's a good way to do it too. There, there is no such thing as being too thorough with your learning and dissection of this. That's what I have found. It's just, uh, you, you know, you, you marvel more and more about what he did when you go into this kind of depth and carefulness. And the work never ends. And it's such a joy to associate with genius, which is what this is. This is the highest level of what was given to us, to our civilization. That's how I see it. I really see this as the ultimate gift for us. So the material that he started here and here, he's using to develop and build on the very last culminating moment in the piece, this gigantic six measure, four measure ascent, and two measure descent. Well, if I lay my two pages again and do it this way, look what you see. Spectacular, look at that. It's identical composition. And I put them both in the green boxes. Four measures of ascent, two measures of descent. But remember, this was still in four four time. This stays in actually goes to 6-4 right here. We're all 4-4 four, four here and then 6-4. That's why this one is so much longer, the two-measure descent, than this four-measure descent. You see what I mean about the details? It just never stops. Pay attention to your meter. Meter is enormous and be able to count out loud. Okay, now let's try this. Breaking it down into the four parts. We have in measure 31, the beginning. I think I'll start with the bass. And I start with the B, and I go up a third to the D, I go up a third to the F, I go up a fourth to the B flat, up a third to the D, up a third to the F, up a third to the A, stay A, diminished. That is your arrival. That's a 6-4, E6-4, A6-4, with E on the bottom. Second inversion, just like, see, he uses the 6-4 chord at the top of the mountain both times. The first time with the Neapolitan chord on page two, this time with the home tonic key of A. Brilliant, just brilliant. So now let's play up to tempo, just those eighth notes. I hear this as one voice. And I'm making a point of this because this goes so fast that this is what you have to watch. You've got to watch these notes. B, D, F, E flat, D, F, A, A, E. Because what's over it on the beats two and four are these chords. you hear there? We had stepwise for these. E, F, G, A. Then D. But you have to play that all with the left hand. So somebody's got to be an automatic pilot here. It's just about impossible to be watching two disparate parts like this. So I like to watch, well, I, I take turns. I'm going to play it right now, and then I'll tell you which one I watched. I kind of did a combination of both, really quick, quick, quick. But it helps to know. between the 
two and the one, the two and the one, the two and the one. So you can watch both of those, but lots and lots of hands are on there. Okay, am I wearing you out? I hope not. Because this passage was my nemesis. I've worked on this passage. I've been playing this piece for 20 years. And when I first started this passage, I really didn't even know all these things were in there. So again, the brackets in red are going to help you. We start with our broken third motive with the B, B, G. And then the answer, stepwise. Then it goes up to the D, fall with the fifth finger, D, D, B flat. Answer, now up to the fifth finger with the F, F, D, up to the A, A, F, C, C, A, C, C, E fourth finger. And all of those were the fifths. And they have to be da, 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 da. underneath, of course, is the alto. The idea that we did on the previous page. And it sounds like this, slowly. Very beautiful. You want to hear every one of these intervals. Let's see how complicated that is. Well, let's see if I can put everybody together from a cold start. Proceeding there is absolutely marvelous. It's an E pedal point on the dominant and then underneath. That's that chromatic line again. Sounds like descending thirds, doesn't it? The dissonance. And it's actually piano there, but that's an augmented chord. So he's going a 5 1 augmenting it. Just gives a little bit of uh, dissonance there and plaintiveness to it, doesn't it? And again, not so predictable. Another beautiful moment there. I love that part here. You know, between the two hands here. This is, the, you know, the, uh, well, no, it's not the, there's more to come here. But this is a beautiful pair of that uh, two measure descent. Slowly. So it's the tenor. And together, the hands. And of course, now this is just Again, he never stopped. How would you like to do this part? The bouncing ball, two octaves apart. Delightful, isn't it? What have you got to do at all with the left hand? Which you do. And crossing over, what is the right hand doing? With our whirlwind idea, it's taking the motive now buried as a canon of imitations, like this.
part here, the buildup here, this is a churning, winding up three times, and it's polytonality. He's got the D minor and the F superimposed. coming over it the right hand is doing this lapping little waves coming up with the a minor and again one more ostinato from that middle system of page two reference and let's put that together you will not believe the chord that he is going to give us out of nowhere uh, to me i think it's the penultimate the ultimate moment not penultimate, the ultimate moment in the piece. The D major, out of nowhere, the parallel major. And listen to this ascent in the bass. Guess what? One last CA leitmotif. And over it, this cascading right hand. And down the octave. moment from D major out of the blue. You know, I was thinking, what does this remind me of? I saw a thousand stars go off. I saw fireworks at night, the whole sky glittering with fireworks. Or how about the Aurora Borealis? Do you think he may have seen one of those? I don't know. Probably not. But I think he, he went there in his imagination. Here it is. <laughs> about this. I can't help it. It's just the most fabulous thing. We have polytonality. We have, it's just like we had, listen, listen, what is that? He goes from here, these little slurs, see how I'm going with the technique? Daddy, daddy, daddy. Everything's really loose. To here. And over that we have little sparks. And what is that on? Well, that's an E major 7 chord. Superimposed over the F. Gorgeous. Could you make a piece out of that? Oh, what is that? C and A. And this. 5, 1. And that is exactly how the piece began. Amazing, amazing. This 651. If you've watched some of these other lessons or have figured this out from working on the piece yourself, that is a reference to the first prelude he wrote almost 20 years earlier from the Opus 3, number 2, the famous C sharp minor. through these preludes. Just a little tiny personal signature, his stamp. I am the king of the 651. <laughs> oh my goodness, I have had so much fun 
sharing this piece with you today and I wanted to tell you that when I first started working on these Opus 32 preludes, like I said, it was 20 years ago, and I couldn't imagine playing all 13 of them. I thought, this is just, I will never get through these, especially number 13. I just said, this is going to be impossible. But do you know, if you stay with something long enough and have a plan and chip away at it intelligently, you'll get there. But what I did when I first started working on the prelates is I picked four and I played them as a little mini group on a full program. I started with number nine in A major, which I just adore. And then I did the great B minor number 10. And then I did the G major number five. And I ended with this number eight in A minor because it was such a great ender. And that's a nice little grouping. You don't have to necessarily play all 13 of these prelates in a, in a cycle. Um, in fact, it's, uh, I don't think anybody really does it. I, I do it, but um, um, it, it's not necessary. You can take certain ones that you like, especially from the Opus 23, 10 prelates. I find that that as a cycle doesn't really work as well. Um, so go ahead and you know choose the ones that you want to work on, the ones that really, really call to you. And feel free to put together your own little mini group of these. So that's uh, it for today. And what Rachmaninoff is doing now, as I said, as psychologically we've finished all of the fireworks of this piece. As a performer now, when I play the whole cycle, that's what I get to do, is take a great big ha, sigh of relief. That one is done. And now I'm going to sink into the parallel A major with prelude number nine. And from that moment on, nine through 13, goes deeper and deeper into the cycle, into the most deep layers of emotional and spiritual content. So I greatly look forward to the remaining five lessons with you. I hope you join me and I hope this has been helpful. And best wishes to you in playing your prelude number eight in A minor. Thank you.